Now, with your Bible open to 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'd like to begin by telling you a story of another portion of the Scripture. You can just keep your Bible there, but let me tell you a story. It's the story of something that happened to the Apostle Paul somewhere around the year 60 A.D. along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea in a town called Melitus. The Apostle Paul was just about to head out by boat to a journey that would ultimately lead him to Jerusalem. And he had gathered together a collection of pastors from the city of Ephesus. They met at the shore of the nearby town of Miletus just before Paul departed. Now, all of these pastors from Ephesus, it's an interesting story, because just a few years before then, Paul had conducted his ministry in the city of Ephesus, and it was a very eventful and uh, at times troublesome ministry. Uh, Paul's preaching at one point caused a riot to occur in the city of Ephesus. That tells you that it was probably very effective preaching. And he almost lost his life. But he'd helped to establish churches there. He had appointed elders there. And so these pastors were now gathering together. He loved them. He loved the city of Ephesus. He loved the people that were there. He loved the churches that he had helped uh, establish. And now he had an opportunity to tell them one final word. He would not see them ever again on this side of heaven. And so he wanted to encourage them. He wanted to remind them of the many things that he was used by God to do in their midst. He wanted to remind them of how he had taught them all the things that they needed to know, the whole counsel of God. He taught them about all the things he suffered. And then in Acts chapter 20, starting with verse 28, let me read this to you. He tells them this very sober warning. Get this picture, all of these elders, all these pastors there. And he gives them this warning. Therefore, <coughs> therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now just think of that warning. Paul's not going to see them again. And he urged those pastors, you be on the defense. The blood of Jesus purchased those churches. Those precious redeemed people were purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. They are his flock. But there are wolves ready to pounce on and consume those sheep. You be on guard and make sure that you protect the doctrine that saves them. Because I won't be there to do it anymore. You've got to do it. It's an urgent warning. A serious word. And now let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1. Because this letter, 1 Timothy, was written to a pastor over the churches in Ephesus. And I want you to listen to what Paul told him. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of our God, and <coughs> by the commandment of God, our Savior, and our Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no 
other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in the faith, or which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither the thing, what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know this, that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law was not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. And think of that. Just as Paul urged those pastors in Ephesus, beware of false teachers who are going to come in and of how the people will depart from the faith. You be faithful to that gospel. What does he tell Peter? The same thing. The message that Paul gives to Peter is that the church is to teach no other doctrine than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'd like to suggest to you, as we come to this study, that there may not be very many times in the history of the church where this warning is needed more than today. I want to tell you that as I felt the Lord was leading us to go toward <coughs> study, I'm doing better, by the way. Thank you for your prayers. Um, as we were going to look at this idea of studying the book of First Timothy, I was a little hesitant because it's a letter written to a pastor. I'm not sure that Paul intended it to be read by everybody. It ended up being put in the Bible, and now we read it. God decided so. But I wondered, what would be the interest or concern to you, the church family, about a letter that was written to pastors? I wondered if it would be better for me to simply study this book myself and to grow from it. But there were a few things that convinced me otherwise. Three things specifically, let me share them with you. Open your Bible to the very end of this letter, to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, where, God, where Paul told Timothy, O oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. O oh, Timothy, guard. What was committed to your trust? What was that thing that was committed to his trust? It was the message of the gospel. The message that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son on the cross. That whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Timothy, guard that. Don't let that get perverted. Don't let people forget that. And brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I, me as a pastor, you as a congregation, that trust has been given to you and me in this time, in this world. And it is essential that you and I guard it and protect it as according to the scriptures and not let it get distorted. So that's one reason why I felt, no, this letter is a letter we need to study. A second reason is what we find in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. <coughs> Pardon me. Paul was writing to Timothy about the nature of the church. And he said, in chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, 
These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Those things he just said there, that's, that's the gospel. All that Jesus is and has, what he has done for us. And the church is that institution that God has established on the earth to be the pillar and the ground of truth. What does a pillar do? It holds things up to be seen. And it's grounded. And that's what the church is. It's that which God has established on this earth to hold up the truth of the gospel and to put it down on street level in application. And there is no other institution on earth that God has given that job to but us. God has not called us to do all kinds of everything that the world thinks we ought to be doing. God has called us to be the pillar and the ground of the truth, which is the gospel. And brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I must do our job. Paul is telling us in this letter how to conduct ourselves in this institution in the light of that gospel. That's another reason why we need to study it. And there's a third reason. It's a very sober reason. You find it in verses four, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy. <coughs> now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth, the time's going to come when people are going to depart from the faith and believe lies from the devil. Do you have any doubt we're living in a time like that? I don't. Maybe these are those last times. The Bible warns us that there will be a great apostasy, meaning a great departure from the faith. You know what apostasy means? It means going out of the way, going off the path. You've got to be on the path to apostatize from the path. And we are living in a time not when people are not hearing the gospel and then not believing. We're living in a time when people believed the gospel and now are departing. And brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I have a duty to proclaim that message and cling to it and protect it because there is no other message by which people are saved than the message of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. And so, this is the letter for us right now. This is what we need to study. And Paul begins this letter with this strong warning. The church is to teach no other doctrine than the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that we don't say other things, of course. But everything that we say, everything that we do, needs to be brought in line with that main message and no other main message than the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not to proclaim the message of social justice. We're not to proclaim politics. We're not to proclaim uh, uh, all of the <coughs> other various things that the world wants to hear or is demanding that we say our message is singular and focused and it is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
because that's the message that saves. We dare not depart from that. And that's what Paul was urging Timothy. And I believe that's what God wants us to do. This is a pretty heavy book. And you know, by the way, we're going to be studying the book of 1 Timothy. You're going to probably hear some things you don't like. I'm warning you now. And that would make sense. Now think about this. If this is a book that is inspired by the Holy Spirit, given to us by God, would it not make sense that you will hear things that you don't like? And I urge you, let the Holy Spirit teach you and let him change you. I promise you, I will do my best to stay true to what it says. <coughs> but as somebody once said, if it rubs your fur the wrong way, try turning around. It's God's word. Now, I want to show you what Paul says. And the first thing that we need to know, this is a command. This is, uh, look at it this way. Paul gives Timothy a command. You protect the gospel. Notice how this command is given. It's not given harshly. It's given with genuine love and affection. Look how he begins. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. Now, look at that for a moment. Did Paul need to tell Timothy... Hey, I'm an apostle, Timothy. I think Paul knew Timothy already knew that, right? Why is he bringing that point up? It's because there's a message of authority here. The apostles are the foundation of the church. The church is founded on the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. So Paul is writing with authority. But notice this authority. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior. <clears throat> you might <laughs> have thought, well, Jesus is our Savior. Yes, but God the Father sent him. And Jesus went in obedience to save us, in obedience to God the Father's call. God is our Savior. God the Father is the one that initiated this whole plan of our salvation. And the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. Think of that. Jesus is our hope. When we see Jesus, when he comes, we will then be glorified with him and we will enjoy the glory that he came to die on the cross to accomplish for us. He is our hope. So I just look at this as a greeting filled with goodwill from the triune God. Now this is a serious command but it comes from someone who loves us and saves us and is our hope who commissioned the Apostle Paul to give it to us. And then look who the letter's to. Timothy, a true son in the faith. Paul was not Timothy's father, by the way. Not biologically. Acts chapter 16, verse 1 tells us that Timothy's father was a Greek man but Paul loved Timothy like he was his own son. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, to Timothy, a beloved son. He doesn't say that to too many people in the Bible. He loved Timothy. He told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions. <coughs> All of these, maybe his coughs too, I don't know. But Paul mentored Timothy, and Timothy imitated Paul like a father and a son. Paul was his spiritual father. Timothy was his spiritual son. And there's great love in that letter. And then notice how he ends it off. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, Jesus Christ our Lord. Here, here's how it starts off. Grace. You know what grace is? 
Grace is God's unmerited favor to those who don't deserve it. It's the only way we could be saved. By grace. God's rich favor, free of charge. And then comes mercy, which is when God doesn't give us what we do deserve. Grace has to come first, then the mercy, and then the peace. A relationship <coughs> of peace with God our Father, with no enmity, no barrier. Well, you just look at it all. And by the way, that's the gospel, isn't it? Grace gives us salvation, mercy. Jesus took all of our debt on himself and paid the price of God's wrath for us on the cross. Now we have peace with God. That's the gospel. And so what a warm and affectionate and loving command this is. Well, then comes the command itself. And listen to the content of this command. He says, verse 3 through 5, or 3 and 4, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Stay there, Timothy, and make sure that some, and I wonder if that word some is, you know who I'm talking about, right, Timothy? Teach some that they teach no other doctrine, nor let the people give heed to fables <coughs> and endless genealogies. You know, by the way, false teaching is a very bad thing because it divides churches. If you look at the division of churches, very often it comes about because of some introduction of some false teaching. And look at what Paul is talking about. Uh, remain in Ephesus and charge that they teach no other doctrine. The apparent thing in this letter that they were teaching was somehow you are made righteous before God on the basis of your good works according to the law. Hey, that's nothing new, is it? You know, it's uh, God gave us his commands and his Old Testament laws, and Jesus is wonderful. Jesus gets the ball rolling, but you need to complete it by your obedience to the law and the observation of the ceremonial rituals and ordinances of the law. You know, th that is so contrary to the gospel. You know what the... That message is, is if you will be good, then God will make you righteous. Be good and you will be declared righteous. You know what the gospel is? You have been made righteous. Now rise up and walk in holiness before God by the power of the Holy Spirit. There is all the difference in the universe between those two things. One is religion, the other is grace. And you and I, brothers and sisters, are to protect that message of grace and not let it get distorted. And don't think this doesn't happen anymore. I've seen it. There have been movements to try to bring the church back under the law. I've seen it. Don't let it happen. You have been made free. Stay free. You're not made righteous by the law. The, quite the opposite. I, I love what somebody once said. Whoever tries to earn salvation by their good works is asking an incredibly high wage for ridiculously shoddy work. Okay? We're not saved that way. We're saved by faith Grace in God's work by faith. And, and then there's this other issue of those who seek to uh, follow after other things. You know, in, if you'll turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Paul says this, 
If anyone teaches otherwise, that is other than what, Timothy, you've been instructed in, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, true godliness, by faith, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds. Beware of that. But you know what else can happen? Is that people can then turn away from the gospel to turn to visions and imaginations and false philosophies and other things which distort. Paul said in in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses or chapter 4 verses 3 through 4 for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables I don't know if you've noticed that, but there's been movements bringing in almost occultic practices within the church. Things that are supposedly to help you to understand your particular self better or to define your personality better. And they have occultic roots. They are not of God. They slip in real easily. Or people will follow visions or or false prophecies, or imaginations, or false philosophies, and they will be misled from the truth, and pretty soon they're not following Jesus any longer. It happens all the time. And so, Timothy is told here, remain in Ephesus and charge some that they teach no other doctrine than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And also to warn people not to follow like endless genealogies where you go into the past and try to find your spiritual troubles or your spiritual heroes and try to find answers to yourself from, from your ancestors. Beware of that stuff, brothers and sisters in Christ. You have been redeemed. You are an individual saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Your connection is direct, not through anybody else. Beware. And so here's the reason for the command. Look at what Paul says in verses 5 through 7. Now the purpose of the command is love. Now you would have thought, well, Paul, that's not very loving. It's not very tolerant. Isn't the loving thing to do is let people bring their viewpoint to the table and let's all learn from each other. Isn't that loving? Paul's answer would be, no, it's not. Grabbing hold of the gospel of Jesus Christ and protecting it, that's love. He says, now the purpose of the commandment is love, but look how that love is qualified. From a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk. I like how the old King James Version puts it, vain jangling. Listen to how this love is qualified. It's love from a pure heart. A heart washed clean from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. No longer embracing sin. No longer even tolerating sin. A love that hates sin. And then it's from a good conscience. Made right before God through faith in Jesus and from a sincere, that means unpretended, unfeigned, unhypocritical faith, the real thing. That's love. And it is from that love <coughs> that we embrace the gospel, and the gospel leads to that love. Let me share something with you. In, first, in Second Peter, you might remember this passage. We talked about it once. In 2 Peter, the Apostle Peter talks about love. There's a process of getting to love. In 2 Peter chapter 1, he talked about the sincere faith in the cross of Jesus Christ 
And then he said, chapter 1, verse 5, but for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, knowledge. To knowledge, self-control. To self-control, perseverance. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. Do you see something fascinating there? We don't start with love. We start with faith. And on that faith we build up. I like what Tim Taylor said. This is the Lego land of the scripture. Here we build up to love. We start with faith. Faith is the foundation. Faith in what? Faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That leads to love. Now here's the theology that supports this command. The command is make sure that the church teaches nothing else but the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the theology behind it. Verse 7, desire, uh, verse 6, from which some having turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Verse 8, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. See, people teach the law, but they don't understand what its purpose is. And remember, the law is good. The law is from God, if it's used rightly. And what is the right use of the law? Not to make you righteous, but to establish for you that you're a sinner that needs to be saved by grace. And then you turn to Jesus. To use the law as the end instead of the means, that's misusing it. Here's what he goes on to say. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate. By the way, as I read this to you, read this list, think of the Ten Commandments. These things are in opposition to it. Knowing that the law is not made for a righteous person, but the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, manslayers, fornicators, for sodomites, that's, an, uh, that's a word that describes homosexuality, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, that's what the law is written for, to show that those things are sin. And then they drive you to Jesus Christ. Let me read a couple of passages to you very quickly. You know what Galatians chapter 3 says? Galatians was written in order to deal with a church that was trying to become righteous before God on the basis of the law. And Paul wrote to them and said, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. That seed is Jesus Christ. Look down at uh, verse 24. Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. After the faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. It's like that which bottlenecks you in sin to the point where you need a savior. You have no hope except by the grace of God. Then you turn to Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law. That is to say, Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's using the law rightly. That's why we need to protect the gospel. And then finally, notice how Paul <clears throat> holds up the standard by which it's given. He says all of these things according to sound doctrine, according, verse 11, to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. 
Let me suggest to you that you see verses 6 through 10 as a parenthesis. Read verse 5 and then verse 11 together. Now the purpose of the commandment is love. The commandment again, protect the gospel. The purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. There it is. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, don't make any mistake about this. This gospel isn't something I came up with. This was given to me by revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm not preaching something I invented. I'm preaching something that was declared to me by revelation of Jesus Christ. And you know what he says in Galatians chapter uh, 1, verses 8 through 9? Here's a red-hot number for you. If we, that means the apostles, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As I have said before, so I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what that which then, then what you have received, let him be accursed. That's pretty decisive right there. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I, I've tried to figure out how best to end this time. And I'd like to end on a personal note, if I may. I want you to be praying about something with me. I, I had a physical exam uh, earlier this week doctor told me I'm doing good, but the bad news is that I'm never going to be young again. Still hope for being good looking, but never young. And what that means is that I love being the pastor of this church. I prayed many years ago that this would be my life's work. And so far, since I'm still alive, it's my life's work. But the day will come, unless the Lord Jesus Christ returns, that I can no longer be your pastor. I hope that day doesn't come soon. But it will come unless the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And that will mean there will be someone else that needs to come here, another man. And I want you to be praying for him. I want you to be praying that he will be a man of God, faithful, who teaches you and serves this church better than I could. Biblical, faithful. Don't pray that he comes real soon, but pray for him. And I want you to have a commitment that you, as a godly church family and you leaders in this church, you will put up with nothing but the faithful teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and do not let anything else be taught here. Do that. And if you do that, God will use this church in the generation to come. Let's pray. Father, we pray in Jesus' name for your hand on this church family and for the call <laughs> to be a faithful representative of the Lord Jesus in this time. We pray, Father, that you would grant that we would be faithful to that message, not veer from it, not one bit, but if anything become more committed to the message, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Preserve and protect the message of this church for Jesus' sake and for your glory. Amen.